In this video, we're going to cover accurate PS1 emulation on the Xbox Series X and S. All right, everybody, this PS1 tutorial is going to be a bit different, and we are focusing on pure accuracy settings for PlayStation games. So this will not cover any upscaling or special settings or anything like that that could enhance your games in ways that you might like. This is just straight up PS1 games as PS1 games, the most accurate you could get them without using a real PS1. So before we get started, this guide is assuming that you have installed RetroArch using one of my provided methods. If not, playlist link will be in the description below and you can go back and do so. But let's dive in. Now, step one to getting PlayStation games up and running on your Xbox Series X and S, you need to source a PS1 BIOS file. There are three main BIOS files you need. SCPH5500 for Japanese games, SCPH5501 for US region games, and SCPH5502 for PAL games. But again, once you have your BIOS files sourced, they do need to be named exactly as shown here. Otherwise, they will not be detected and not work. If you happen to still own a PS1 of any variety or a PS Classic, I do have BIOS dumping guides on how to get your BIOS files from them. For this video in particular, I'm using my PS Classic dumped BIOS files. But once you have these sorts, we just need to put them in our RetroArch system folder. If your RetroArch system folder is still on your internal SSD, go ahead and open up Durango FTP and start your file share. And then back on your computer, access your file share using your preferred method. Open your local folder, find your RetroArch folder, local state folder, system folder, and drag your BIOS files right inside. I already had them here, so I'm just going to tell it to override them. And there we go, they are now placed and ready to go. If you have your system folder moved over to USB, plug your USB drive into your computing device, open it up, open up the system folder you created, and drag the BIOS files inside. Again, I already had them there, so I'm just telling it to overwrite. And once your BIOS files are placed, we are ready to move on to game setup. Now, PlayStation games can come in a variety of formats. The most typical you'll see are BinQ format, but you can use older formats too, like CCD, or convert them over to PVP and CHUD. In this video, we are going to be converting our games over to CHUD, as it is one of the best compression methods, and a lot easier than manually converting everything over to PVP format. If you have games that are in ISO MP3 format, find better rips. So to convert games from BinQ format to Chud, I have a prepackaged zip folder here that contains Chudman, as well as Sleeper Ninja's QGDI to Chud bat file. But there will be a link in the description below to download this zip file. Just get it extracted. You'll be left with chudman.exe and qgdi to chud. Just put these files in the same directory as your PlayStation games. And then run the qgdi to chud bat. And it will begin compressing your games into chud format. So just sit patiently and let it do its thing. And once the program is completed running, just press any key to exit out of it. Now, one of the best things about this bat file is it is able to compress games that are in subfolders. So, for example, I had Chrono Cross, Red Alert, Final Fantasy VII, and Metal Gear Solid in subfolders. And it has created chud files based on those games as well. Unfortunately, I just have to re-add them to my subfolder here in a second, but that's no big deal. But once the conversion is completed, we could just clean up all of our old bin Q files. We don't really need them anymore. Make sure you have them backed up somewhere if you don't want to lose them. And then you could also delete Chudman and the Q GDI to Chud bat file. And that leaves us with much cleaner looking PS1 games. Now I'm just going to... Delete everything out of my subfolders here for multi-disc games real quick. And then put my multi-disc games back inside of them. There we go. Now there is one more setup step to getting multi-disc games perfected for use on Beetle PSX or Swan Station. And that is to create M3U files. So go into the folder you have your multi-disc games stored in. Make a new text document. You can name it whatever you want, doesn't matter. I mean, you typically name it after the game, though. 
But once the text file is created, go ahead and open it up. And we are going to add the name of both disks or more, if there's more than two disks. And we're going to copy the file names and paste them into this text document. And you need to make sure to include the extensions. If for whatever reason the extensions aren't showing up, on Win for Windows users, you can go to the View tab and check mark the file name extensions box here. Anyway, once you have all the disks in your text file, just go ahead and save it, close out of it, and then we need to change the extension from .txt to m3u. And it'll pop up warning here, getting mad at you, that's fine. Just click yes. And there we go. Chrono Cross is now ready to go. So I'm going to repeat that process on my other three multi-disc games. And there we go. All of my multi-disc games are now ready to go with proper M3U files. Now, PlayStation games can be run from the internal SSD if you have an S drive set up or from a USB drive. So I'm just gonna copy these over to my USB drive real quick. So go to my games folder. I already have a PlayStation games folder in here from earlier setup attempts, but they're all in just normal bin queue format. And I'm just gonna update them to this new chud format. So I'm just gonna delete that folder and copy the new folder right on in. Or if you wanna put them on the S drive, just open up your Durango FTP file share again, make sure that server's running. S, program files, Windows apps, RetroArch folder with the x64 at the end, your made games folder, and then just drag them in. But once you have your BIOS and games placed, we can go ahead and just back out of everything on our computing devices and plug our USB drive back into the Xbox and load up RetroArch. Once you have RetroArch booted, you're free to begin loading up your PlayStation content. So one method of doing so is to go to load content, navigate to the directory your games are stored. So if you're on dev mode using USB, that should be under E. Retail mode USB should be under D. Or if you put them on the S drive. But you can find your games. Choose a game, choose a core, and tell it to run. Not a big fan of that method personally, so I like to make a games playlist. So you can go down to import content. And since we have the games in chud format, we'd have to do a manual scan. So choose your content directory out of your possible folders again. Find your PlayStation games folder. Scan this directory. System name, you can press right on your D-pad to scroll down to Sony and find Sony PlayStation. Default core for this tutorial, we are covering Sony PlayStation Beetle PSX. Turn scan recursively off for now. If you have your multi-disc game separated into subfolders, we'll come back to that in just one second. And then tell it to start the scan. Once that scan's completed, we could turn scan recursively back on. And now we're going to set a file extension to just find those M3U files that we created earlier. and press start. And once that's set, start the scan. And once that scan's completed, we will now have a complete PlayStation games playlist with our chud files and M3U files. There we go. And from here, we could just select a game and tell it to run. And as long as you have everything placed correctly, you should be greeted by a wonderful PlayStation start screen. But there we go, PlayStation 1 games up and running on our Xbox Series X or S in their most native and accurate way possible, just by default, it's pretty nice. But anyway, there's a lot more to cover here, so let's go ahead and jump over to it. So by default, PlayStation emulation uses just a normal original PlayStation controller, so not a DualShock. If you want to change your controller settings over to a DualShock, you can open up your RetroArch Quick Menu using your Set Hotkey, go down to Controls, Port 1 Controls, and you can change between a number of different PlayStation controllers. So, the most useful will probably be DualShock. 
Now, do note, not every game supports the DualShock controller, so you might get an error popping up that says, hey, there's no controller detected, even though you have DualShock selected. To combat this, you can either go back into port 1 controls and change it back up to a PlayStation controller, or if you head into the Options tab, somewhere in the middle here, or near the bottom, I guess, is an Enable Analog Mode Toggle, so this lets you turn the DualShock sticks on or off, depending on the need of the game. It's funny, they say there's a hotkey to do this toggle quickly, but that hotkey is to in-game reset most PlayStation games, and it doesn't work anyway for this command, so you have to just come into the quick menu and change this however you need to. But once you have the controller set, you can save it as a core remap file, so that way all of your games are just running with a DualShock by default. For any games that don't run with the DualShock, you can also save a game remap file with the port 1 changed back to just a normal PlayStation controller. Your choice, really. Now, another thing you might be interested in for PS1 controller ports, if you happen to be playing something like Metal Gear Solid and going into the Psycho Mantis fight, you can change the mapped port that the controller is plugged into without having to utilize a second controller. This map port option is perfect for those Psycho Mantis fights. So, the fight starts, you can load right up, change your port over to port 2, set it to a DualShock as well, but yeah, changing the map port is going to save your bacon in that Psycho Manus fight. Now let's cover changing discs in multi-disc games. For this example, I've loaded up Chrono Cross Disc 2, told it to start a new game, and now it is telling me to insert Disc 1. To change discs, we do need to adjust some settings within RetroArch for the Xbox version. So open up your RetroArch Quick Menu, and once it's open, just go ahead and press B to go back out to the main menu, and scroll up to Settings. From here, navigate down to User Interface, and we need to turn off Pause Content when Menu is active, and Pause Content when not active. If we don't disable these options, the disc swaps don't really register, and it can be kind of frustrating, so change those settings, then you can go back up to main menu, quick menu, and we're going to save those as a core override, so that way it doesn't affect other cores that don't need it. You could also save it as a game override if you want to, but eh, preference again I guess. But to do the disk change, now head up to disk control, press A on eject disk, and you'll get a current disk index option that pops up. If you press A on this, you'll see both of the disks, or all the disks, that are located in your M3U file. And then just select the disk you need to change to, and insert the disk. And the game will change disks, and here we go, starting a new game of Chrono Cross, as intended. So again, eject disk, change current disk, select the disk you need, reinsert the disk. But with that, you now have the basic operation of Beetle PSX on how to change controller types and change discs for multi-disc games. So let's go ahead and talk about some of our options that we're going to mess with for accuracy's sake here. So going into the RetroArch Quick Menu, head down to Options. So internal GPU resolution, we're going to keep this at 1x. Dithering pattern, we're going to keep this at 1x. We're going to skip over the PGXP stuff here. We're going to cover that in a Swan Station video. You can turn on internal FPS if you want to, so you can see the wonderful frames that PS1 games ran in. It's pretty awesome. If you stay at internal resolution of 1x, the line to quad hack isn't really needed. You can turn on frame duping. We're going to skip over all of this other stuff and go right down to skip BIOS. If you don't want to have the PlayStation BIOS pop up every time you start up a game, you can turn this option on. Do note, if you have PAL copy protected games, this option needs to be left off. Next, you can set your preferred aspect ratio. Corrected is the default, but you can also force it to 4x3, uncorrected, or NTSC. I leave mine on corrected, but personal preference. Next, we're going to skip down to CD access method. Depending on the speed of your USB storage, you might get warnings that pop up that talk about how the game might be loading slowly or something and to use a different method. It's on synchronous by default. And this is, just like real hardware, it'll read the disk image when it needs to. You can set this to async or pre-cache. I set mine to pre-cache. Takes a little bit longer to load, but makes it so there's definitely no issues on the loading department. CD loading speed, I recommend leaving this at native. It can cause issues by increasing it, but if you want to have faster load times, you can push this up. 
we're going to leave memory card zero method on lib retro. This makes it so we don't have to worry about managing memory card storage. Every game gets its own save. Next, we have enable memory card one. So this is the memory card in slot two. You can enable this or disable it if you want to. Not really needed. Shared memory cards. This will be handy if you do want to have shared memory cards for games like Metal Gear Solid, Psycho Mantis Fight. I don't really find it all that useful. Do note, if you want to use this option, you will need to change this from LibRetro to Mednafen, and then you'll also have to use the uh, memory card index files here to choose between a slot that your memory card is in. Kind of a hassle, which is why I don't really use it these days. Analog self-calibration, turn this on. So here's that enabled DualShock analog mode toggle button again. So if it's off, your sticks are on. If it's on, your sticks are off. So remember that, like we talked about earlier. You can enable multi-tap, so if you're going to be doing some PS1 multiplayer that require more than two controllers. And unfortunately, light gun stuff still isn't really working yet, so we could just skip over that. But that's going to do it for our core options that we're covering in this video. If you have options you want to save for certain games but not others, you could go up to Manage Core Options and save them as a Game Options file, so that way that game has those specific settings while not affecting others. Now there's one last thing I want to cover here real quick just to get the most out of your accurate PS1 emulation and that is shaders. If you head into the shaders tab you can enable them by pressing A and then you can begin loading up some presets. Some of my favorites include CRT easy mode. I've been having a lot of fun using Royal lately. Or if you head into the presets folder, I really like these CRT Guest Dr. Venom Max DR ones that give you a nice sharp image with thick scan lines and it just it looks really nice in motion. But as always shaders are going to be highly personal preference so go through them find the ones you like and apply them. There's really no best option when it comes to shaders it's all personal preference. But once you have a shader set the way you like it you can head over here to save in the shaders tab and you can save them as a game preset or a core preset. I like my games having a uniform look about them, so I save mine as a core preset. That way, every time I load up a PS1 game, they're all going to have this look. But that's going to do it as far as accurate PS1 emulation is concerned on the Xbox Series X and S version of RetroArch. Again, this is just a method of having PS1 games play like an original PS1. This isn't about the fancy upscaling and stuff like that that you can get out of the system. For that, I recommend cores like Swan Station because you can just really push the effects a lot further because it has a it has a proper DirectX 11 renderer, unlike Beetle, so you can really push more out of it. But thank you as always for watching today's tutorial. I hope you have found it helpful in getting your PS1 games up and running on the Xbox Series X and S. But now I do have a couple of favors to ask all of you here at the end. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that thumbs up, thumbs down button, just depending on how much you like today's tutorial. And if you haven't done so already, hit that sub button so you can see when new videos go live on the channel. Loads of content coming your way, and would love to have you along for the ride. For anyone interested in further helping support the channel, you can also check out that join button here on YouTube, or the Patreon link in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. A little goes a long way to keeping us up and running, and bringing this content to you. Big shout out to all of our current champions, thank you for believing what we do here, and keeping us going. You're amazing. But that's going to do it for this one, so until next time, my wonderful internet peeps, you all stay awesome, and we'll see you back next video.